forward to hearing from our experts today. And we have Ted Kellner, retired founder and portfolio manager with Fiduciary Management Inc. And he's serving as our moderator and will lead a conversation with Dr. Kevin Spellman, who is the David O. Nicholas Director of Investment Management and Senior Lecturer at the Lubar School of Business. Following their conversation, we invite you to use the chat feature or the raise your hand feature in meeting in the meeting to ask any questions you may have to ensure the quality of the broadcast. We would appreciate if you could turn your cameras and microphones off at this time. Also, this webinar is being recorded to share with other friends and alumni. I now like to turn the program over to Dr. Kevin Spellman for his opening remarks. Kevin, to you. Well, good morning and thank you, Kaushal. Um, I'll give you one more housekeeping item. Um, I, we have a lot of slides in here and a lot of data. So um, we, these slides have been sent to you before um, the, this, this uh, webinar. So you can find those in your inbox right now if you wanna follow along there as well. Um, what we're going to do here today is I'll, I'll give you up to about 15 minutes of comments and then Ted and I will hold a Q&A discussion for you know, 30, 35 minutes in the last 10, 15 minutes. We'll take your questions for both of us. Um, my comments uh, center around five topics here. Uh, the first topic is I believe we were late cycle before coronavirus and the markets weren't worried about this. So the recession that we had really caught everybody off guard. Um, I'll give you a little overview of the market environment right now and how government stimulus has been propelling the markets up. I'll talk a little bit about coronavirus trends because they are very important. And we'll talk about why deaths may not be rising along with cases. I'll give you a little bit of evidence for my opinion that the market is quite overvalued at this point. So first, um, late cycle dynamics were present before coronavirus and the markets weren't worried. So a lot of different charts on this um, slide. So I'll point to make sure you can see what I'm doing, but I want you to look at the top left graph. I created a composite on the top right graph of financing variables on the X axis and spending variables on the Y axis. Financing variables, when you're to the left, that means you're a weak economy. Spending, when it's on the top, that means you're a strong economy. I didn't hear you. So financing variables. So we need to make sure people um, um, uh, put yourselves on mute right now. Thank you. Uh, so financing variables, this is over the last two years and what's been happening. It's been deteriorating. We've been deteriorating for two years. Financing is Fed financing, is bank financing. The spending variables include business and consumer. So even before coronavirus, we we're in a relatively weak position to deal with this. So on the, the next column is business factors. The next column is consumer factors, government, and banks. So let's look at just one graph from the business side. The blue line here is debt, on the business, non-financial, as a proportion of GDP. And the gray bars are recessions. As you can see, the debt to GDP for businesses tends to peak right before a recession. A peak here, a peak here, a peak here, and look at that peak. Now, why does that happen? Well, typically when times are good and strong, our, our expansion was over 10 years, people forget about risks. If they forget about risk, they expand, and if they expand, they may expand with debt or buy back shares. So we came in a situation on the corporate side, heavily levered. Well, just like businesses that may not have been thinking about the risk, consumer confidence was also very, very high going into coronavirus, just like it was at the peak of the financial bubble, just like the peak of the internet bubble. Now, the purpose of the government in bad times is being like, the good car that jump starts the battery, the bad car, the economy. Well, in order to have a good battery in the government, that means you need to be in a situation where you have your fiscal um, you know, books in order. Well, we didn't. 
This graph on the x-axis is unemployment and the y-axis is deficit to GDP. We were down here at the end of 19 with a deficit to GDP of 6%. This data goes back to the 60s or 70s. We have never been that bad going into the crisis. Now this is 520, but really with the three trillion in stimulus, we're down here. Well, that's normal. But the problem is we had a lot of debt in the system beforehand and we're just raising more now. Now, but not in the financial sector. This is debt to GDP in the financial sector that has come down. So the financial sector is really not to blame this time around. Now, was the market prepared for this? I would argue no. Just look at the top left graph here. Um, we have the 10-year bond, so the bond market versus the stock market. The price we pay for the stock market, we tend to measure on a price to earnings ratio. When PE is high, which it was, relative to bonds, that basically means we're paying a lot for earnings. Why would we pay a lot for earnings? Because we think earnings have low risk of going down, or we think there's a lot of growth. Well, in this particular case, we had a lot of growth after 1219, but negative, not positive. We're talking about positive growth. Typically, when interest rates are low, we'll pay up more for stocks because, you know, the option, either get a low interest rate or give a dividend yield and some growth, you know, the money flows to the stock market. Well, we were at a very high level, high expectations going into this coronavirus crisis. A little bit more about the market overview. This is kind of a busy table, so let me take your attention to certain things. So on the top, I have... Um, large stocks, S&P 500, mid stocks to 400, uh, small stocks to 600, and this is the year-to-date column. As you can see, large stocks, this is through fi Friday, we're down 7%. Small and mid, we're down much more. So from the whole year, you would say this is a risk-off market. Why do I say that? Well, if large stocks outperform small stocks, it's, it's risk-off. Small companies tend to have, um, a lot of them, 40% or so, don't have any earnings. They tend to have more debt. They tend to be more domestic base. And they also tend to have more cyclical sectors. If we just look at small cap value, which is the one that's down the most, 29% through last Friday, 30% of small value is financials. So overall, this year has been a risk off market, even with the market near all time highs. We're only 11% down from an all time high. Now at the bottom, we are down 35% from an intraday all time high. Going back to the 1970s, the average sell off in a, in a crisis recession was minus 33. So we got to about the average. Now since the bottom, the last three months, large, mid and small, I have all done about the same return. This is value versus growth. Growth is still done much, much better. And why does growth do much better in these typical environments? Is because when growth is scarce in a recession, people will pay up for growth stocks. Now, the recession, if you look at small, they're supposed to earnings down 58%. The S&P 500 is down 22. So that explains why small is underperformed this year. But if we look at the forecasts going out, small is supposed to be up 91% in 2021. The S&P 500 is supposed to be up 29. By the way, if you look at those two numbers, we get back to 2019 earnings by the end of 2021, two years. That's how long we, our earnings recession is before we get back to an all-time high. We've had a lot of volatility. I'm just going to look at a couple of these charts. The number of down days greater than 2% is pretty typical this year versus other crisis times. We had 21 days this year so far through last Friday that we were down more than 2% in a day. Now, other times when we had that many days was the financial crisis, a recession, an internet bubble, 1987, recession, early 1970s. So the volatility we had going down is not really out of line with what we normally have in crisis. However, we're only halfway during the year. We could set a record. Now the market has bottomed and it's risen. I would argue that is also normal. What I argue against is that it's risen too much. 
So if we look at the middle graph on the bottom, this is just a progression of earnings estimates since the third quarter last year. The black line is the progression of earnings estimates for S&P 500 for 2020. They're down 30%, but where did they bottom? At the end of April. Where did the market bottom? Well, it bottomed a month before, that was government stimulus, but normally the market bottoms when earnings expectations bottom. The also market tends to bottom when this ISM PMI indicator, a survey of manufacturers, bottoms. It's highly correlated with the stock market, the blue line. And it's bottom now. We had our reading come in today at 52. A reading above 50 says we're expanding again. Government stimulus is probably what's caused the expansion in, this, in the market to go up. The money must go somewhere and it made it to the market and it made it for the real, real economy too. The Federal Reserve and fiscal spending may be 40% of GDP this year. The Fed balance sheet's up, already up $3 trillion. This is the balance sheet in the black line on the bottom left, $4 trillion to $7 trillion. Um, by the end of the year, that $3 trillion could go to $4 trillion. We've had already $3 trillion in fiscal stimulus. We're talking about another package in July or August. It could be another one to two trillion. So four and four by the end of the year, that's eight of GDP of 21. That's 40% of GDP we're throwing into this economy. Um, if you look at this graph here, this blue line, that's money supply. Money supply is created when you know the Fed buys up bonds and when uh, loan growth happens. Money supply is growing relative to GDP at greater than 20% now. It leads the PMI index, which I showed you on the last slide, is highly correlated with the stock market. So you'd expect the PMI to start rising. So the one warning I'll say is you know, the market stopped rising for about the last month. The Fed's balance sheet stopped going up for the last month. And bank lending, the blue line here, has started to come down. That means banks are starting to curtail and now it rose here, why did it rise? Corporations drew down on their current line. We have PPP spending. If the corporations that are small can't access the credit markets, they could start going bankrupt. Corporate debt in the credit markets is an all time high. Small companies get their money from banks. A little bit on coronavirus trends. As we know, coronavirus cases are going up, but deaths are still going down. Now, I give you five reasons for why deaths are not going up yet. One is treatments could be improving. Even if we don't have like a, you know, a um, all around great, great treatment, maybe doctors are just getting better at treating people. Or maybe the most vulnerable are staying home. Here is the deaths by age group. The oldest ones are on the top. You see it's getting to be a little bit less as a proportion and the younger are becoming bigger. So maybe the older are staying home. Maybe the mobile younger are catching it. We heard that a lot in the news. But if they're mobile, eventually they get the older people sick and then you get the deaths. Maybe we're testing people more. So we have more cases. The number of positive tests at the peak was above 20%, at bottom below 5%, but now it's rising above 5%, probably 7, 8% now. So I don't really go for this argument so much. I really think hospitalizations and deaths just a matter of time. Why is this important for the markets? Well, even if governors don't shut down the states, people will stop going out. People stopped going out before the governors all shut down the states back in, in March. Open Table tells you how many people use their apps to basically select their restaurants. The last week or two is just plummeted, even though states aren't shutting down. So is the market overvalued? My, my think, my thought is yes. So I look at the history since 2014. This is the S&P 500, oil collapse, manufacturing recession, um, trade war, Fed raises interest rates, a recession scare, and then coronavirus. But we've already made it almost back to the top. Now, remember, price is a function of profitability, which we don't have really much right now. It won't be back to an all-time high earnings at least two years. 
Price is also related to growth and risk. I have 17 reasons here where growth could be lower and risk is higher in the future. I'll just look at two. First of all, in order to get us through the crisis, corporations have to take on more debt. If you take on more debt, that just borrows from future consumption when you have to pay it back. Future consumption for corporations is hiring, investment spending, which leads to growth. So growth could be lower. More debt raises risk. If risk is higher, I should be less willing to pay for those earnings. So I argue that the market, the magnitude of the recovery is kind of crazy. The fact that it's up doesn't surprise me. And this is just more evidence on how long it normally takes to get to back to earnings high. This is the financial crisis. It took 50 months for earnings to get back to high, about the same time for the stock market to get to an all-time high. That's my comments. And now I'll take some uh, questions from Ted, and we'll go back and forth. And Ted will also offer his opinion on, on some of these things. Um, so, Ted, go ahead. Yeah. Kevin, you talked about the uh, the Fed and the, the Fed's expanding balance sheet and also the, the government uh, deficits and the de government spending with the programs that have been put in, put in place. Um, do you see uh, do you view those as correct actions and how do you see those unfolding for the rest of the year? Well, uh, first of all, uh, the purpose of like fiscal policy and the Fed, um, one of the purposes to be the, like the good car to jumpstart the economy. So I think the, um, they did the right thing, but the problem is, is you have all kinds of possible negative consequences. And we, we talked about this one, so I put this in the appendix, and I think you have an opinion on this too. Um, what we're doing right now, and no one's really talking about it, is setting up for inflation in the future. If we have a bout of inflation, which we haven't had for a very long period of time, the markets could get very scared. Interest rates could go up. The Fed maybe won't be able to stay in their easing mode, and we could get a second recession if this happens. I have a, a model here uh, that uh, the blue line is the model and the gray bars is change in an inflation rate. And as you can see, the model is predicting inflation maybe to start going up again. Inflation, the core inflation is the black line here has come down to a little over 1%. Um, the market's not expecting inflation to go up based on the tips. Over the five years, the market's only expecting about 0.7% inflation. You know, what drives up inflation? If money supply, money supply times velocity of money equals GDP, price times quantity. If money supply keeps growing um, and velocity of money lending starts rising again as the economy starts to get open, you're going to get prices going up. Um, Ted, I think you, um, well, let's just keep on the inflation. Populism, uh, which is basically coronavirus has impacted the uh, lower wage earners more, could result in wage growth, which raises costs. Diversifying supply chain raises costs, which could result in inflation. If interest rates are low and the economy approves outside the U.S., the dollar goes down, import costs rise, commodity costs rise. A trade war raises costs. Fiscal stimulus is geared to the lower income, so demand could go up. All of these are inflationary. So that is something the market's not thinking about and you know, could really derail things, and it could be a secondary consequence, and the Fed's not worried about it. Is, is, <laughs> is along those lines, uh, Kevin, you know, uh, Milton Friedman said uh, you've listed a number of reasons for uh, and why we might get higher inflation. Milton Friedman was one of the um, well-noted economists that always that felt that at the end of the day, uh, inflation was a monetary monetary printing and stimulus, and and the Fed's balance sheet has expanded, and we've had significant um, expansion of the monetary policy. So you think Milton Friedman, if he were here today, he said it would say unequivocally, we are going to have higher inflation at some point. There's a lot of factors in it. Many of you just pointed out. So. Would you be a believer then that uh, we are about to see sometime in the next 12, 24 months, significantly higher inflation given what types of policies have been put in place today? I think you could. 
All right. So I think the probability is much higher than it was before. I would definitely not put it less than 50 percent um, uh, being a, a betting person and an investor. But there are other drivers of inflation lower. Um, obviously, technology, more people, uh, you know, basically buying online. And, you know, it's pretty easy to look at prices if you're buying online. High unemployment, obviously, that's a negative to wage growth. Low capacitization could keep corporations from raising prices. And also, as debt constrains spending for corporations, it also does for consumers. But I do believe um, we have a much higher probability of inflation than we've had for a long time. My list on drivers of lower inflation used to be a lot longer than it is now. And now you see this is fewer drivers than what's on the right. And I will also remind you, you know, a lot of people say um, the Fed is kind of the savior and they're looking like really, you know, the good ones uh, in here. But remember, Greenspan talked about a rational exuberance in 1997. And Greenspan at the same time had the gas on the money supply gas pedal. And then we had an internet bubble. Bernanke, I think it was 2006, says, hey, the housing bubble, it's not a bubble. It's just a few places. As he fueled the market with more money supply. Bernanke and Yellen, post the financial crisis, uh, lowered interest rates, which allowed us to borrow even more. Debt to GDP in the entire economy is higher now than it was at the peak of the financial bubble. So I would argue we fixed the financial crisis, which was because of too much debt, by allowing people to borrow ever more increasing amounts of debt at lower interest rates. So I don't really think the Fed is potentially the savior. It may be um, the devil in disguise. <laughs> no. One other thing, just a long, question along those lines. Uh, you'll recall, as I do, because we go back a long time, there was a, a theory and a belief that the government, the uh, expansion of the government uh, debt and balance sheet was would eventually crowd out uh, borrowers. Do you see any risk of that happening, given, again, the very expansive policies and the significant deficits in addition to debt in the, the U.S.? Is that something we haven't heard a lot about that? And yet the debt in this country is just mushroomed at the federal level. Well, I mean, your, your comments could happen absence the Fed. So let's talk about that. So if the Fed is, uh, sorry, if the government is issuing all kinds of debt and there's only so many lenders, um, then interest rates should go up and it could crowd out others. But as long as the Fed is willing to buy up, you know, uh, the mortgage debt and the treasury debt at more than 100 billion a month, we may not have that problem of higher interest rates and the crowding out. However, that doesn't mean there's not a negative repercussion. Um, tends to be people vote um, based on how the economy is doing. And probably now they'll vote based on how coronavirus cases and deaths are doing in the economy. If we get um, an, a Senate, a House, and a presidency all democratic, uh, we could have higher taxes. So clearly, uh, we have a bad situation on on our debt situation right now, if we get higher taxes, that wouldn't be good for the market. So I would argue um, we, we do have some negative repercussions and it's possibly higher interest rates as well. But I think the Fed's out there buying up all the bonds, trying to keep the interest rates low. And I might add an indiscriminate buyer. I don't think they, the, the price becomes much of an issue with the Fed. So that has an unintended consequences of keeping companies, I think, and I think we've seen that uh, companies that really shouldn't have access to capital have it because of some of the Fed's action. But uh, that's just my that's that's my well, opinion. One other well, question in the short. Wait, wait, no, can, um, I add to, can I add to that? Um, I think it's a great opinion. Um, one of the things that the Fed has done and they actually Powell actually said this, that he was worried about um, the markets working, but not really worried about valuation. That means the biggest buyer in the market doesn't care about valuation. Um, that also means you're saving companies that were bad actors, had too much debt, that should have gone away in a recession. That's how you get rid of excesses. 
So you're rewarding the bad actor and you're punishing the good ones. And that's a, that is an, uh, when we talk about unintended consequences, to me, that's a, that's a very clear and disturbing one for what it means long term. It rewards bad behavior. And uh, in, a, in a free economy, in a kept system, that unintended consequence is normally not a good outcome. So I think you and I agree on that. Let me ask you one quick question in the short run. Um, as it pertains to what we've seen, we've seen the, the huge uh, unemployment numbers, but yet the last couple of weeks, the market, uh, when it had a, a sharp rallies, recall, uh, the job numbers caught everybody uh, uh, by surprise. We had good job growth when they expected job decline, and retail spending has been good. Is that is it sustainable, or do you think that that is a short-term phenomenon? Um, well, it, it, right now we have a situation, opening economy versus, you know, like from the university system or government system, we have to have new budgets that come out at the end of the fiscal year. If we don't get stimulus spending in the states, um, there's gonna be way more layoffs, way more cutbacks. Uh, if the companies that are open, half open, uh, keep laying off people, uh, you're gonna have more layoffs. You know, you know, think about it. If you're a restaurant and you're operating at 50% capacity, are you covering your variable costs? Maybe, but you're not covering your rent and your interest costs and things like that. 50% capacity could mean more bankruptcy. So you have a lot of people losing their jobs as others are getting jobs. But let me address your question head on. Those good um, unemployment numbers, employment last month, and we get an employment number tomorrow. And by the way, ADP came out this morning and uh, over 2 million but below expectations by 600,000 today. Uh, the jobs report comes out tomorrow. Last month, the jobs report surprised um, very, very positively. But that jobs report was very influenced by PPP, basically the loans to small businesses, which was five, six hundred billion dollars. Those businesses were forced to hire back people, spend 75% of their spending on hiring. I worked out the math. That was 20 million people they had to hire. So I think the jobs number from May was very much influenced by the government. I also think the retail number was very much influenced by the government. We had a stimulus check that went out. We had PPP, so people were getting their jobs, whether or not they're getting paid whether they're working or not. And unemployment compensation could be higher than what people were being paid on the jobs. All that is in the past except unemployment compensation, and that runs out at the end of July. If people right now are unemployed, they're starting to think, I got to get a job. They could start cutting back. And again, the a big stimulus from PPP and that jobs, uh, we, we could have a negative um, surprise on the jobs number tomorrow. We had a little bit negative on the ADP number today. So we've had a lot of temporary boost and that temporary boost is going away. So now it's relying on businesses truly opening and not going out of business if they can't open up enough. We could have... Um, you know, negative surprises going forward, but of course the fiscal stimulus could give us another round in a month too. You know, I can add a little bit of a granular uh, anecdotal comment to what you just said. Um, one of our uh, companies that I have on a, uh, on a private equity portfolio, we called, I think we recalled about 146 people. There were 38 of them that didn't come back. And when we queried them as to why they didn't, it worked out that they were making $64 a week more on the government stimulus packages than they would have been coming back uh, to a full-time job. Um, again, another unintended consequence that just has you shaking your head as to what, what these policies in fact are actually doing in certain instances. Um, but let me ask you another, just, you talked about uh, the leverage in corporations uh, was going up before the crisis. How do you, um, how do you look at their future now? Well, um, let me just get back to this. Uh, so let me just expand on the leverage. It wasn't just the amount of debt that was in the um, corporations. Um, if you looked at the type of debt that was trading the market, the triple B debt, the amount of triple B debt before coronavirus 
which is the low end of investment grade, was more than all the investment grade debt before the financial crisis. And if you look at this debt that was triple B and you look at like interest coverage ratios and other ratios, it was worse than it was, you know, 10 years before, which means that triple B bet probably shouldn't even been triple B. It should already been junk. Uh, if it weren't for the Fed going out and buying fallen angels, I think we would have, um, you know, a lot more, a lot higher interest rates. Um, <laughs> Corporations that um, leverage up, and we have lots of corporations that have leveraged up and have basically no earnings in the small, they should be allowed just to go bankrupt in recessions. We need recessions every once in a while just to punish the bad actors, reward the good actors, reset expectations on risk so we can move forward you know, um, in a good way. Uh, so I think there could be a lot more bankruptcies to come. Right now, uh, uh, bankruptcies in the high yield space are running around 4%. To give you some perspective, uh, when oil prices went down four or five years ago, uh, the oil sector uh, took that up to maybe 5%. During the great financial crisis, the number of bankruptcies in the high yield, you know, below triple B debt space was like, 12 to 15 percent. Why isn't that gone up already? Um, it could be because you don't go bankrupt unless you have a solvency problem. You can't pay off your interest. You can't pay off your debt when it comes due. As long as the Fed is providing liquidity, you may not have a solvency problem. But I think you should have a solvency problem. I think what the Fed is doing is creating more problems down the road. And if we come out of this with more debt, and no one's talking about this, everybody's talking about a V-shaped recovery and then we got now over five years of growth. If you come out with way more debt, let's say you get back to all time higher earnings by 2022, but you're leveraged up and you're not spending money on growth, we could go right back into a recession. And then we go into it when the Fed's already has interest rates at zero and the government's really leveraged up. Will we still be willing to spend like we are then? So we have risks with this. Yeah. Ted, do you want to add any comments to that? Uh, no, I think you've covered the waterfront pretty darn well on that. And I <laughs> want to make you sensitive to the time issue. I wanted to get to a couple other questions before we open it up to questions from uh, the people that are on the call. Uh, you talked about the market being... Um, in your view, overvalued, as you said, we're just 11 percent away from all time high. Is there anything in your opinion, though, that could uh, make that justified and allow the market to go higher? And then conversely, uh, what would be the things that you think would really lead to a, a correction or a, a downward drift in the market from here? So, so is it, all right. So as an investor, we always have to think about how could we be wrong? So remember my list for the market being overvalued, I had 17 things on my list for the market being overvalued. I have 11 things on my list for why the market could go up. Let's take a look at a, a couple of them. Uh, so I just said, there's no solvency risk if the Fed provides liquidity, but remember banks are cutting back. The money must go someplace. You know, it, there's a lot of money that's actually sitting on the sideline and money market funds are at an all time high right now. The Fed says it can do more. The government's eager to spend. If interest rates are zero, you know, where are you going to put your money? You're going to put it in the stock market. Conditions appear to be bottoming. The one couple things that I would say are all these reasons I just told you tells you the market's still overvalued, but it can go up. All right. It doesn't say the market should go up for a, a good reason that you got fundamental, true fundamental improvements that are not just temporary based on government stimulus. But there are a couple things that say that, hey, maybe things are okay. The consumer balance sheets. Before the crisis hit, the financial obligation ratio, which basically says how much um, mortgage debt, rental, property taxes are as a percent of your income, was came way down. It was I think it was like 16% in the 
peak of the financial bubble and maybe 12% now. Now keep in mind, interest rates are low and income was high. Savings rates are high, wealth is high. Housing has not declined. The low rates have kept housing up. Housing makes up for the average person, I think it's the median person, 40, 50% of wealth. If the stock market's an all time high and wealth's an all time high, that keeps up spending. So consumers are, are much better off. So those are some, uh, and maybe, you know, coronavirus deaths don't go up. So there are some things that could make the market valuations justified. However, I think most of the things I say on here are not true fundamental things that should make it go up. You asked also about catalysts to make it go down. Uh, you alluded to one earlier, you know, what if the jobs number is weak? What if the retail spending and jobs, which were propped up by the government, surprised negatively? What if the amount of debt we have results in higher bankruptcies? Um, uh, what if Trump going into the election, if he's worried about losing, does something like ramps up to trade war, which almost put us into a recession here? So there's a lot of risks out there that could make the market go down. I mentioned debt um, and associated bankruptcies, deaths rising, um, maybe unemployment and retail spending um, turning and surprising negatively and something that Trump may do like with the trade war. So there's all kinds of catalysts that could drive the market down. Yeah. I would add one, just one comment on valuation that you, you talked about that. Um, but um, we talk a lot at fiduciary management about the um, the quality of earnings, and I would argue, and we can't do it here uh, in this short time frame. The quality of earnings in corporate America have uh, deteriorated significantly, in, in in my view. And we we talk about earnings before all the bad stuff. The gap between uh, reported earnings, as many companies report them today, and gap is as wide as I believe it's ever been. I, I think it's about 23, 24 percent. And that, so that quality of earnings gap is huge. Uh, the other thing uh, that and the other sector, I think, Kevin, and I'd be interested in your comments on this. Um, one of the things that's pro propelled the indices, indices is clearly this gap between value and growth. So with the growth sector having outperformed value, um, I think, well, now going on on 10 years. And those valuations have really had a significant impact. If you go down, as Luthold does, by decile of company size and tech, the, uh, the tech companies, the FANG companies have significantly higher valuations than the overall market and, and have had a significant Im impact on uh, the performance of uh, the ind indices. Um, do you think that's sustainable when you talk specifically about the FANG companies and unicorn companies? I mean, part of that you've addressed with this uh, money supply and, and making credit available to a lot of companies, including startups. But are the valuations in the tech sector the growth sector, uh, in your view, sustainable? Um, I, for one, being as anybody that knows me, I'm a value investor. It has gone on much further and much longer than I was suspected. And clearly, the value sector includes a lot of energy companies, a lot of banks, financials, which have clearly been hurt. But is that gap in that valuation of uh, the tech sector, unicorn companies, can that be in your view, sustained uh, in this environment and going forward? Well, uh, it clearly, uh, when the, the market started rallying, it was the, um, basically the fangs and other large stocks that were going up. And um, a lot of people said this is not a sustainable rally because the other companies that were cheaper and got hurt more, this is S&P 600 value versus S&P 500 growth. Over that period of time, the cheap value companies, and by the way, S&P 500 value is 31% financials have underperformed by about 25%. Um, they are really cheap. They were cheap before the start of this chart relative to the FANGs. The FANGs right now on a PE basis are trading at 2.8 times the PE of the S&P 500. At the start of this, they were at 2.5. So they got them more expensive. And the tech has gone from 1.2 to 1.3. Now, let me tell you why this has happened. And I know this is small. So again, we sent out the, these charts. If you look at 2020 earnings, S&P 500 is supposed to be down 22%. The 
the fangs on are supposed to be up, well, 30% more than the market. So they actually have a positive. So they've risen based on the fact that their earnings growth is way better than the market this year. Technology is the same way. Technology earnings this year are supposed to be 24% better than S&P 500, which is down 22, so they're supposed to be flat. Now you asked, is this sustainable? And so first of all, I think if the economy recovers, the small value probably will rise much, much more than the tech and the large growth. And you can see every one of these moves up, this is small value versus large growth. Every one of these moves up in the market, these are substantial moves up in market, it's been a rotation to small value, which tells you if the economy does get on good footing, the large growth don't do well. And on top of that, in, at the first quarter, Microsoft pointed out they had more cloud adoption. I may be getting this wrong. More cloud adoption in the first quarter than they had in two years. Okay, so Microsoft's not part of my thing. They're part of the technology, though. If the technology companies are bringing forward demand, that means later on everybody's adopted the cloud. What happens to their growth a year from now? So the, you're starting with a high valuation relative to the other companies that are cyclical, that have been really hurt, that could rise a lot with the economy. And you may have been bringing forward some of your demand. Now, on the opposite side of the story, maybe that just accelerates the cloud adoption. Um, so, but I, I'm kind of with you, Ted, that I think some of these valuations are uh, egregiously high. <laughs> And so given that comment, and one of the things a moderator is supposed to, to moderate, so I'm going to, I've got a couple of quick questions. I think we want to leave uh, about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A from those that are on the uh, on the call, the, the Zoom uh, with us here. But a couple of quick, given what you've just said about the market, uh, FANGs, overall market, um, and you've got practical experience in management. If you were managing uh, an active portfolio today, how would you position your portfolio given what you've been talking about? Well, I'm, I'm a fundamental investor. So if I say the market is pricing in something it shouldn't, um, I have to play defensive, okay? Um, you know, it, playing for a market correction. But I do believe the you know, economy will recover. So I'm, I'm sitting out right now, personally, um, I'm playing defensive. Uh, and then, but I do plan on getting back in, but when I get back in, I'll probably get back into some of these cyclical small value stocks during the correction. Now, before the uh, recession hit, I was preparing myself for a recession because I thought we should have one. I thought we were late cycle and, you know, if the Fed had not lowered interest rates, we would have a recession. And I recommended people buying the quality growth stocks that have done well. I would love to buy those stocks if we have a correction. But the problem is, is those stocks like technology, like FANG are really expensive. So I will gravitate in the correction to this small value. And, but I'm really picky. I'm very worried about what if we don't come out of this? We may not have a vaccine or the virus could mutate. So as I'm picking the stocks, I want to look at ones that do have less debt, that do have earnings, that do have a business model that they can survive a very long time of a shutdown. Keep in mind, we only have about 6% of the population that's had coronavirus. We're just at the beginning. This is the beginning. This is not the end. This is the beginning. So I think you have to play defensive and look for these opportunities with a correction. That begs one more one more question before I ask my last question and uh, we open it up. Why? Uh, what's going on in your opinion? Cases cases now and and uh, foreign countries are now shuttering travel abroad because our cases are rising uh, at a at a faster clip right now in this country than than many others. Why, in your opinion, is is that occurring here in the U.S. versus uh, that not occurrence in your in European countries? Okay, so for my doctorate degree, I, I traveled to England for that. And I'm in Europe a couple times every year. Uh, so as I love Europe, um, I've learned about their culture. And in the US versus Europe, we have some differences. 
So first of all, in the U.S., we're much more individualistic. You know, take care of yourself. And why do we have to be that? Because we don't have as big of a social safety net. You know, Japan shut down, but at last I saw, and I'm, I'm not sure about the number because I was surprised, their unemployment rate's only gone up a little. Ours has gone up to 13%. If U6 has gone up to 20%. We don't have the safety net here. In Europe, we're the, Europe is basically the same size as the U.S. Their case count has come down and it's stayed low. Why? Because in Europe, they're less individualistic. They have more of a social safety net. They want to take care of each other. Now, with that being said, the best world economy this year, if you look at developed markets, excluding U.S., developed markets, Europe, China, China's the best then the U.S., Europe's somewhere behind. So we did a trade-off opening up our economy and, you know, coronavirus cases go up because we, we needed to open up the economy because we didn't have these bigger safety nets. Mm -hmm. And last question then before we, uh, what, as you look at the landscape then and uh, what we've experienced and where we are today, um, what do you see as the lasting impacts of coronavirus as it pertains to uh, our lives and particularly what it might mean for business going forward? That's actually an excellent question because if you're trying to position your portfolio, you really have to think long-term. So first of all, I think the online trend is is accelerated and I don't think it's gonna go backwards. So that basically has a meaning for uh, retail um, and it has meaning for office. And so I think the, you know, the brick and mortar um, is not gonna get better. And also on office days, um, maybe not. Uh, no, if you look at short-term trends, you know, I have a friend who lives outside of New York and he put his house up for sale. It says, great time, everybody's trying to get out of the city, which means there could be more building. Um, and it also means if we diversify supply chains, bring supplies back home, that could lead to investment spending, job growth, could be good for industrial sector. But you can't spend if you have more debt. So if you have lots of debt, that's basically going to borrow from future growth uh, for a, a long period of time. So you and then you know, let's look at the government debt that could lead to higher taxes, lower earnings as we try to pay this off. So there's negative repercussions and there's maybe some positive repercussions and shifts and that'll happen because of this. Yeah. Well, Kevin, you said you said that's an excellent question. These are all excellent, excellent questions. You and I came up with them the last the last week and a half, so they're all good. That's a particularly good one. But uh, you more than I. Well, we're running a little longer than uh, than the moderator should have. Why don't we've got about twelve minutes or so by my clock uh, for our hour? Why don't we see if there are any questions uh, that any of the, the participants have uh, for either one of us uh, in the final few minutes here? So and again, to the left of the hang up button, uh, two to the left, there's a conversation button, and then you can also raise your hand and I'll call on you. <laughs> and if there are not any questions, we'll just keep on going. All right, uh, so I, I see a question um, from Jeff Gavin. Um, how has velocity behaved in this cycle? Uh, the Fed expanded. Uh, balance sheet from 800 billion in 2007 to over 4 trillion, yet we did not have inflation. We also had high rates of employment during that period. Uh, so the velocity, so when we expanded the balance sheet back in the crisis, money supply went up, velocity went down, basically the amount of times you, you know, lend in the system. And, um, and you really didn't result in inflation because it's, the equation from economics, take uh, take us back a couple, is money supply growth times the velocity of money, how many times it grows through the banking system, and that means the banks are lending it, equals price times the quantity. This is real GDP. In the financial crisis, we didn't have inflation, okay, even though money supply was growing. So a couple things. First of all, our money supply right now is growing way quicker than it did in the financial crisis. Also, uh, we're in the post the financial crisis, we were telling banks to delever their balance sheet. We loosen the rules on banks and this crisis said, you, 
in order for PPP, I, I, I'm not positive on this, it said, don't worry about the credit worthiness. We won't count it against your equity offer. Lend, just lend. And then we'll make up for the losses. So bank lending went up. If bank lending goes up again, so if we take all the proper charges from the banks over the next couple quarters and the economy starts moving around and they have all these deposits, deposits arisen by 2.1 trillion and they start lending again, velocity could go up. And of course, money supply has grown quicker than it did in the great financial crisis. So I think we have, and also we didn't have inflation back then because we had more of these things driving down inflation at the time. At the one time I had demographics over here, people were aging, getting older, which means they demand less. Now these people are retiring. Yeah, they demand less, but a bigger proportion of the employment pool is in the younger groups. And if you look at average hour earnings growth and the younger age, they're, they're pretty high. Target just raised um, on, um, the minimum wage to $15 an hour. So I think we have more inflationary pressures now. We also had globalization growing back after the financial crisis. Now we have deglobalization. We had a rising dollar, which reduced inflation. Now we could have a falling dollar. There's all kinds of shifts here that I think the Fed's not paying attention to, and the market isn't either. Great question. Uh, so, uh, Ted, please uh, offer your suggestions too. Um, uh, David Bauer has, the stock market seems to be holding its value assuming earnings will rebound quickly. How do you view the risk that it might not occur? And how, and I can't see the rest, how and when would the market react? Do you want to take that, Ted? Uh, you know, you cut off, I didn't hear the last uh, okay. part of it. And I, the, the, it I'll, I'll do it again. The stock market seems to be holding its value, assuming earnings will rebound quickly. How do you view the risks that it might not occur, earnings not, may not rebound quickly? And how and when would the market react? Well, I, I, you know, I, I think this recovery, you know, there are all kinds of discussions about um, what the recovery might look like. You take almost any letter of the alphabet, but my, but my view, right, you really kind of touched on much of it. I think this the recovery is going to be slower. I think uh, once all of the stimulus and the uh, the PPP packages, I think we'll see higher unemployment. I think earnings will most likely disappoint, and I think most likely uh, be lower than people's expectations are right now. And you've touched on how much this market has rebounded. So um, I think that will be that realization would be covered uh, with a market that probably has a, another down leg and disappointing, a disappointing uh, period of performance. Um, I'm not in the V, I'm not in the V camp recovery. I'm more in the L elongated L. Um, I don't think where things will really start to come back until uh, late this year or more likely early next year. And I don't think, uh, I think ultimately you talk, touched on it also um, until this virus is uh, a, a virus or a uh, vaccine rather is ultimately um, uh, comes forth from some of the people that are working on it now. Um, I got one other question I wanted to add, and you kind of touched on it, but uh, one of the things, I gave a speech last year uh, when, as I was getting ready for this talk, and one of the things that I, I talked about is investor returns, and this was done by um, the, in, um, uh, the Investor Institute. Uh, it covered the returns of in, uh, mutual funds, and it was it was for... I think it was for 45 years into 2018. The average return was about just a shade under 10% or 11% for mutual funds. But when they delved into the individual investors, uh, it was closer to about 4%. And the difference was investors reacted. They in bull markets, uh, they pl plowed into the into funds and into uh, the market. And then when the market recovered, when the when the recessions came and the market decline uh, and it had the inevitable bear market, they left They left mutual funds. So they were buying at the highs and selling at the lows. There was an article the other day though, and I'd be interested in your comments on this, that there, there's new investors getting into the market and the smaller investors 
have not reacted negatively to this market as the data I just gave you would suggest they have. Um, any thoughts on that as to if in fact that is correct and it seems to be and we'll see that data coming out. Uh, are investors reactions on the belief that markets historically have always recovered? Have they maybe gone away from that uh, buying high and selling low uh, uh, phenomenon that we've all talked about in the past? So we have we have some mixed information on this. AAI surveys, these are probably retired folks. Um, they're still a little bit bearish. Um, however, you are right. We had record growth in brokerage accounts being open. And if you think about the stock market should be determined by the marginal buyer and seller, right? If the marginal buyer, and I don't remember what all the numbers were, but it was in a Wall Street Journal article maybe three weeks ago, that you know the number of brokerage accounts opened up by Robinhood, um, um, you know Schwab, and all those they're like up 30 to 80 percent over the last year. So instead of watching sports, people are getting in the stock market. Evidence of that is Nasdaq volume way higher than New York Stock Exchange volume. The growth in the brokerage accounts, the percent of the market cap in the largest stocks, like the top 10 stocks, are right now which those would be popular with really small investors, is the same as the internet bubble. Now, of course, those top 10 stocks this time make earnings where an internet bubble they didn't. I think um, that it probably is influencing the market, those um, investors getting in, um, and it's a bad way because they're not basing it on fundamentals. But go back to your study, um, mutual fund investors over maybe 20, 30 years have basically um, bought high and sold low. The fact that money market accounts have lots of money in it, and this AAII is still right, reasonably bearish, says that there is a lot of people out of the market. Maybe these are the really young people that are getting in the market and doing this, and, and some of the other individual investors um, are not. Uh, there was a survey, I, I heard it on uh, CNBC, of millionaires. And by the way, the millionaires, the wealthy people, um, control about 80% of the market. Uh, they, uh, their allocation to equities was at a low, I think, at the beginning of June, and it started to rise. So I think there's, they're still selling at the bottom and um, buying at the top, except for these new marginal investors that seem to get in, probably because they need something to do since sports isn't on. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the way you could really see that is when Hertz, um, wasn't it Hertz that went bankrupt? In bankruptcy, yes. you lose all your money in bankruptcy, yet the stock rises. That doesn't make any sense. Yes, I noticed that. I noticed that too. Uh, are there any other I can't, uh, you have the, uh, the, uh, okay. We have uh, actually a race. Any other questions? We have actually a raised hand from David Bauer. So I'm going to go to um, this and, and make sure David can um, uh, speak up. So if you can speak up, go ahead. No, you, you guys covered the question. I put it in the text box. So thank you very uh, oh, much. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Well, um, I think our, our Dean, uh, Kaushal, um, uh has a, a couple comments just to conclude. And, and thank you for your time. Wow, what an insightful conversation this has been. Uh, thank you, Kevin and Ted, for sharing your expertise with all of us, uh, informing us to be more uh, uh, thoughtful in our investments. Um, and uh, I would like to point out that Kevin uh, brings the same level of expertise and analysis uh, while conducting the investment management certificate program that we have and our students greatly benefit from the deep expertise that Kevin and other instructors bring to this program. And uh, the investment management certificate program uh, is has certainly made a mark uh, in the Milwaukee investment community and as well as nationwide. And it's all thanks to Kevin's tutelage. And this has been a really great forum to share the knowledge of Lubar faculty with the community and we hope to offer more webinars in the future so with that let me conclude and thanks everyone thanks all those who attended thanks to the alumni association 
at UWM for co-sponsoring this program. And thanks again to Ted and Kevin. Thank you all.